Hello, everyone, and welcome to this World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Podcast Meet General Club, Episode 3. I'm Savleen Kaur from Chandigarh, India, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by a renowned pediatric ophthalmologist, Dr. Ramesh Kikanaya, on this podcast to discuss a paper by his group. Dr. Ramesh is Director, Child Side Institute, LV Prasad I Institute, Hyderabad, India. He's an excellent clinician and an avid researcher. Welcome, Dr. Ramesh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sablin. Thank you so much. So we are going to discuss a paper that is titled Visual Outcomes and Complications in Infantile Cataract Surgery, a Real-World Scenario. It is published by the British Medical Journal Open Ophthalmology Group. You can freely access this article online at the BMJ 2021 issue 7. The co-authors of this paper are Gaura Chatanavar, Akshay Badakare, Ashik Mohammed, and Ramesh Kukinya as a senior author. So uh, to begin with, Dr. Ramesh, it's a, it's a very interesting paper. And I wanted to start off by asking you, like, what prompted to you to do this study? Uh, there are ample studies on infantile cataracts. So what made you do this real-world scenario? Yeah, thanks, Sablin, uh, for having me. Uh, yeah, this, this paper, uh, it, it's a culmination of a lot of ideas from the last decade. We were implanting lens uh, in infants. Uh, for more than a decade now. And if you look at the reports which are coming uh, in, a, in a very ideal situation, what you are seeing from infantile FAKR treatment study, it's, it's, it's uh, the results of which are contrary to what we experience. That's why we wanted to do a study uh, in a real life scenario in the sense there is no you know, have to do something because of the prospective nature of the study. It really happens what, what you see in your patients. You have unilateral cataract, you have bilateral cataract, you have patients with the comorbidity, you can you have patients with ocular comorbidities. It's not that one size which uh, fits everybody. That's why we wanted to look at our group of patients. Like if you see uh, the infantile FA care treatment studies, they look at a particular, you know, one or two factors. We wanted to look at not only uh, age, we wanted to look at eye. There is no ocular comorbidity in the sense, uh, you know, there is no anterior segment dysgenesis. We wanted to look at the socioeconomic status and the follow up of these patients. And we wanted to differentiate between unilateral and bilateral. Basically, we wanted to take one criteria, that is the IE and it's related, not just looking at age of the patient. That's the genesis of this uh, study. Right. So it was a great paper because it had like 173 eyes of uh, 97 infants and you prospectively evaluated their visual outcomes and complications over one year. To begin with, as you said, that you implanted you uh, IOL looking at the eye size. So what are the factors that you keep in mind when you want to decide for or against an IOL besides the age of the child? Yeah, besides the age, we have a three-pronged approach, one, two, three. The first one is the morphology and the biometry, axial length and the corneal diameter, which should be more than 10.5. I think the IATS used uh, 9 millimeter. We went beyond that because we thought that that's a risk factor. We did not want any anti-segment gestenesis, no gonioscopic abnormality, you know, th no cyniche and too much of uh, rubella related, uh, you know, ophthalmopathy. We wanted to rule out. That's ophthalmic. Second factor we wanted to rule out is uh, intraoperatively. You know, you have uh, some new finding like uh, PHPV with a lot of processes where the diameter is very small and there are coexisting things. What you realize intraoperative. Third factor, which uh, we usually people don't consider, is the socioeconomic status. You know, intensity of coming for a fallout, we need to really look at. And their insurance status, all of this matters. So we took this three pronged approach. And also the last experience which uh, we have explained there is the surgical experience. You know, a person done only five pediatric cataract and suddenly jumping into an infantile pediatric cataract could be different, difficult. 
So we wanted to take a surgic, surgery experience also of the surgeon. These are the parameters with which we decided to implant or not. Uh, you also mentioned that the axial length was 16.5 as the study mentions the method methodology that it's more than 16.5 when you decided for intraocular lens implantation. Uh, what was your target refraction that you kept uh, for these kids in mind? Yeah, we if you see 70 plus percentage of our cohort of patients in this study were bilateral. Right. And close to 30 percent were unilateral. Right. So we had a different strategy for unilateral and bilateral. I will start with the unilateral. We wanted to go closer to emetropia. It's not that we wanted to, you know, have zero between the two eyes. We wanted to go close to the emetropia because we looked at the axial length of the other eye. If there is not much of myopia for that particular infantile age, we went close. When I say close means we went on an average of plus six diopters under correction. This is what we looked at. But for a bilateral, we went a little bit higher in the sense, uh, you know, if you take for the age plus one is seven, it's not that six under, under uh, correction weighted. We went up till eight or nine in these patients because in the long run, we saw the myopia. So, and also, Less than six months, we went eight or nine. If they cross beyond six months, then we came back to around seven or so because uh, we have an experience in the first three to four months, the axial length and the eye parameters really grows very fast. You know, children, uh, even a month waiting makes the eye parameter very different. So we, we had these three criteria, unilateral, bilateral, less than six months, and more than six months. So yes, as you said, literality, and I think the age uh, is a very important factor when we decide whether we want to, you know, what target refraction we want to keep. So uh, then we also found very interesting things in your results of the study. We saw that the mean age was 14.5 weeks. Torch was, of course, a very important cause of, uh, the infectious part was a very important cause of cataracts which I think uh, is, uh, I'm highlighting just because it's like a contrast to the developed world. And your mean age of surgery was also like 23 weeks. So you think age at uh, what the children present to us is also later than the developed world. And that also makes us, you know, maybe choose IOL over versus no IOL or no? Absolutely. I agree. The etiology and the age of presentation matters because if you see compared to other studies, the real time of surgery is maybe three to four weeks later. We had a different age group, if you see in that study. That's why, again, I wanted to see the real world, what really happens at this part of the world. So you're absolutely right, which I also didn't expect when I looked at prospectively. We will have rubella as the most common, even in 2020. You know, I never expected that. So... Unfortunately, still, that's the most important parameter. And rubella eyes, you know, it's a it's a condition which affects all parts of the, uh, you know, eye and even heart and uh, ear. Most of them will have a microconia. Most of the times, they will have microsthermus, be it unilateral or bilateral. That's why you will see in our results, still... The, the eyes where we could implant is much less than what we really expect. You know, earlier, uh, on an average, we do around 40% to 50% of the patients, okay. infants, we implant. But here, it is one third because rubella plays an important role. So I would say uh, it's a surprise uh, result for us. And also, you're absolutely right. The etiology with which it comes, it affects the eye. Mm -hmm. That's why I would not say age is a factor. It's, it affects the eye in different scenario. And also age of age of presentation definitely is, uh, you know, two or three weeks more than the, uh, you know, best yeah. in the developed world. So that's again a, a kind of awareness among parents, all that. It's still a little bit lower. But having said that, it gives an, us an opportunity to implant the lens in most of these patients. Because I personally have seen six weeks versus 
11 weeks or 12 weeks makes a huge difference in terms of deciding for lens or no. It's not that six months and beyond makes a difference. Mm -hmm. But if you take age as a criteria, even, uh, you know, six weeks to 10 weeks, it makes a difference. So if there is a two week late in presentation, chances of putting a lens becomes a little bit more. Yeah. And more and more evidence comes that coming that, uh, you know, even if there is a week or two weeks delay, ultimately the vision will be okay in a bilateral cataract patients. Right. And do you think uh, maybe operating in a, some weak old child and then following up in a busy OPD and then you see that you have, uh, you want to check the visual equity and then, you know, start amblyopia therapy. So does that also make you choose as aphakia versus pseudophakia? You feel there's a difference in the amblyopia therapy that you are more stringent with and, uh, you know, doing a visual equity assessment, does that also make a difference? Yeah, definitely it makes a difference because, uh, the child is not looking through that. Most of the patients who can't, uh, you know, we don't implant, at least in this part of the world, they go for glasses than contact lenses. Most of them. Uh, if they are wearing glasses, assessment of visual equity is much faster. And in, your, in our experience, visual rehabilitation or visual equity improvement is much faster than uh, just aphakia. So assessment and also the need for past therapy and other things are much less because binocularly with the lens in place, their binocular vision potential is much better. Even if you have to give glasses, there is a partial optical correction all the time. So we see that rapidity in the visual gain uh, in this infant, infants when they come for follow-up. That is why I think the paper saw that emetropization was faster in the pseudo group. And for yes. us, I think clinically it is very, very relevant. So coming Absolutely. on to the uh, results, you you know, visual access opacification is that all what we are worried about. So you think that VAO should uh, deter us from an intraocular lens implantation? I mean, does that deter you? Yeah, uh, obviously one in five patients uh, they have. But if you look at the closer look at the paper, uh, I think it's around 17 eyes in that group. Yeah. Most of them have had something like, uh, you know, either PFE or some aspect, wherever we implanted, they had a little bit of visual access opacification. If you don't implant a lens, chances of second surgery is 100%. So only, only thing I would say that still it won't deter because if you see the visual access of pacification percentage and as an absolute percentage, it is much less than what is already been published if you put an implant. But if you compare within our own group, for close to 5% versus uh, obviously 20%, there is a difference, significant difference. But looking at the overall picture, still it will not deter me uh, for implanting a lens because it's it's like a, it's a very short procedure. Uh, obviously, it's a second procedure, no doubt about that. One of the e-ways has to be taken off for membranectomy. So I would not deter, even if there is a statistically significant, but it's not, if it is one in, uh, you know, four patients or 100% of the patient developing, then all the patients will be doing uh, some kind of second surgery. So here, taking that in picture, still it would not deter me from implanting a lens. Probably we can look at the research uh, things where uh, some modification in this in in the form of posterior capture. This is what we are really looking at at this point of time. Can we change in this group of patients? Can we change our methodology of surgery? and then lessen this percentage. That's what we are looking at. So I think in a, overall an excellent paper. And for me, the highlight uh, of the paper was that you do not look at the, you know, just the age as a number. You have a lot of other factors that should actually, uh, you know, decide, that makes you decide against or for intraocular lens implantation. You look at the eye size, you look at the surgeon capabilities, you look at the socioeconomic status and how, post-operatively the child would optically rehabilitate whether it's contact lenses if you're sure about that maybe you know you could opt for aphakia 
and uh, you should you know the decision to implant should be just balanced keeping these pros and cons in mind anything in the end that you would like to highlight or maybe one concluding remark when you are deciding in trochlear lens implantation in infants yeah uh, you very well summed it up uh, sablin i just want to say that uh, having that balanced approach is very important and uh, eye is very important eye and associative factor is very important than just one factor which is age more we look at the eye and its association more information we'll get and uh, more uh, factors we will get to decide on uh, implanting a lens or not than just looking at age look at eye not just age and take a balanced approach when you treat this patient surgically that's what i just wanted to say thank you that's absolutely brilliant thank you so much dr ramesh for joining us today and thank you for uh, you know uh, agreeing to do this wsps podcast i had the pleasure to interview dr ramesh kikunaya for uh, more information on wsps you can visit our website wsps.org also follow us on our facebook page and subscribe to our youtube channel i am sablin and thank you very much for listening to us thank you sablin uh, thanks for the opportunity